do this. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks everybody for coming, uh, both in person and on Zoom, I'm told. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Jennifer Pierre. Uh, Jennifer Pierre is a UX researcher at YouTube. She's a user experience and HCI researcher with expertise in social media, games, critical data studies, and social informatics. Her research explores how people, especially underrepresented minoritized groups, use media and data to form and maintain communities. So Dr. Pierre's work is of interest to our department for three main reasons, I think. One, her take on social media, games, and interactive media of all types is unique, cuts across the interests of many of our faculty and students in an exciting way. Two, she's a great example of a researcher who has managed to speak to both academic and tech sector audiences. And three, she has a long ethical and intellectual commitment to understanding and studying youth, particularly youth of color. Again, I'm very proud to welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Pierre. Thank you so much. I'm so touched by that introduction. <laughs> I am really, really excited to be here. Like Roderick said, I'm Jen Pierre, user experience researcher at YouTube, and I am really excited to speak with you all today uh, about the connection that I've observed in my work between social media and games research. So while well, I'm currently leading research on the intersection of creator and creators and viewers on YouTube, specifically through the lens of fan funding products, I'm actually here to share some of my past research across academia and industry that has continued to influence the work that I do today. Specifically, I'm going to be looking at uh, sharing my thoughts on what I feel social media research can offer to games research and how the intersection of these two areas of scholarship can enable us to effectively design and build inclusive experiences for our users. And I'd also like to share, I'm excited to specifically be here to share this because this is a line of thinking that I've been pondering for a long while, but I've always kind of struggled to put down coherently on paper. So I'm excited to share a, for, a first output of this type of work with you all and kind of start the conversation. All right, so this is a quick overview of what I'm going to be covering in my talk. So first I'll give a little bit of a sneak peek of what the kind of central thesis of this talk is and how we'll go through the, the overall overview. Then I'll talk a little bit more. I'll take a quick step back and talk about who I am, um, but won't linger on that too long since there was already an introduction, which is great. Then we'll jump into the first chapter of the story, which is why I started studying youth social media use and what I learned, then how I transitioned into games research and use the learnings from my social media dissertation research to inform that work. Lastly, how I was able to use both of those processes to center inclusion and inclusive design in our products, and then I'll end on why it all matters, what some of the next steps are for this type of work, and I'll wrap up with an overview and a conclusion. All right, so first, what's the main point of this talk? I like to kind of give a at least a brief overview so that we're all on the same page around what my central argument is here and how why we're all kind of brought together to talk through this. But first, a little bit of background. So our perceptions of video games have changed a lot in the past decade but also much of it has stayed the same. There remains this kind of tension between the narrative of the lone gamer who's kind of eschewing all social contact. And this has also been, I think, particularly revitalized through the discussions of virtual reality gaming, although that continues to change through things like, thank you, through things like the metaverse. And on the other end, there's this idea of gaming as a naturally social experience. So when it's compared to social media, Gaming can sometimes flip-flop between comparing favorably or unfavorably to social media. Either way, though, it's still bucketed as kind of in this, this overall negatively viewed uh, spectrum of screen time. So when gaming does compare favorably to social media, it's seen as almost an inherently social medium. So it's strengthened through the increased research that we've seen about the prevalence of things like group gameplay and multiplayer games and the types of friendships that are cultivated through gaming. And in this narrative, Gaming surpasses actually social media as the superior type of screen time by combining social experiences, things like narrative immersion and interactivity in really effective ways. And while this can lead to fruitful conversations across the industry, it can often lead to this type of siloing of product development in terms of only thinking about a type of media or a type of technology as one or the other. So either a social media platform or a specific game. And that also leads us to inextricably think about these as tied to the boundaries of the technical setting that we're using them within. And while this is often really necessary for the engineering of these types of products and experiences, 
for understanding the benefits, the barriers, and the growth opportunities and their use, especially through tools like research, I think seeing the fluidity between them can actually be just as important. So how similar or different actually are these technologies and should they even be compared or contrasted in these ways? And I'm arguing in this talk is that while there are of course really important technical and behavioral distinctions between the two, these two areas actually share many of the same overarching user needs. My experience transitioning from social media to games research gave me a really unique opportunity to actually reflect on these differences and similarities and intentionally blend these two areas of inquiry to build a sort of process that enables us to design products that served as wide a variety of users as possible, regardless of the context that they were using these texts in. So this brings us to the main thesis of the talk. What I'd like to demonstrate in the next kind of 45 minutes or so is that intersecting social media and games research enables a more holistic view of these technologies as part of a shared system, socio-technical system, that's centered on three core needs, both on the player end and on kind of the broader user end. These needs are connection, self-expression, and play. And this holistic approach enables inclusive design by centering the way that we evaluate and assess these technologies in a way that focuses more on the overarching social needs than the hyper-contextual tactical behaviors. This talk will demonstrate this by walking through first my dissertation research on youth social media use and how that informed my work on creative inclusive behaviors. My social media research helped define and establish what those overarching needs were that were surrounding social media use, especially for minoritized youth. While my work in games translated this into an even more applied setting through identifying what the key barriers were to actually meeting these needs in the game space and defining key levers for evaluating and meeting them within the context of games. So uh, a little bit of background and definition before we kind of jump into these specific next sections. So what do I mean when I'm talking about a socio-technical system? In its simplest form, I'm really just referring to it as a system that comprises of a social subsystem as well as a technical subsystem. And within the field, especially of CCW, the term stands for the recognition. The aspects of both the technical as well as social subsystems need to be considered when we're introducing that new technology and you need to acknowledge that there's a complex relationship between the two. And in my work, I really align with Herman et al's take here that while they agree with and acknowledge a lot of the criticism um, that has been levied towards the idea of a socio-technical system over time, there's still a lot that is valid and useful of it uh, about it, in, in especially using the original term literally and exploring its meaning in different applied contexts. So next, what does minoritized mean? So later on throughout this talk, I'm also going to be using the term minoritized to refer to users that are categorized as minorities, specifically referring to this active process of minoritization that these groups often undergo as defined on the slide. And I use the term minoritized to represent especially my current thinking and how it's evolved over time. But I wanna call out that some of the slides included in this talk that are based on my past work may include similar terms like underrepresented or at risk as they were reflective of my thinking and the specific project context at that time. So currently my thinking has evolved to actually use the word minoritized across the board, especially to specifically call out these power dynamics at play. Also want to give a shout out to Roderick Crooks actually for your fantastic scholarship in this area and helping really influence my thinking um, and evolve in here. All right, so really quickly, who am I and why am I positioned to talk about this work? So as was mentioned earlier, I'm a human computer inter interaction researcher and an information scientist. I have expertise in social, digital, and interactive media, CCW, critical data studies, and social informatics. And I use this to explore how minoritized groups use media and data to form and maintain communities. So while I'm currently doing this work at YouTube, there were a lot of other institutions in my past that really influenced my growth across the industry and in this field that enabled me to talk specifically at this intersection of these two areas. So, before working at YouTube, I was at Stadia, which is Google's cloud gaming org, which is where I really entered into more specifically the space of game development and gaming. Um, I'm also an affiliated researcher in the next, as of the next couple of months at UC Santa Barbara, teach at University of Michigan on UX and gaming. And I received my formal academic training uh, through my undergrad and PhD at Cornell and UCLA. So these are all institutions that really fostered my sense of growth and the, my identity as a scholar in this area. All right, 
So now that you know a little bit about me and the overall landscape of this talk, let's dive into part one of this learning process of intersecting social media and games research, specifically focusing on what I learned through my dissertation work on youth social media use for social support. So my dissertation used ethnographic methods to really explore how youth that are categorized as at risk, really focusing on the actual active process of categorization, use social media for social support. And this work highlighted the key overarching social support needs of these youth and identified beneficial ways of using and designing social media to address those needs. So I put together, as I was starting this area of inquiry, the problem space, the framework, and the questions like you do with most dissertations. And I want to walk you through this just to get a sense of the landscape before diving into the specific findings. So in terms of what the problem was, I was working in a space of youth development, specifically focusing on minoritized youth. And often these type, these youth and these groups of youth communities can be perceived as at risk um, and may face additional barriers to assimilation to adulthood as a result of that categorization and all of the kind of social context that are embedded within that. In addition, our current research and intervention approaches, especially through things like youth development programs, tend to focus on more social comparative rather than community-based assessments, so really lacking a focus on what the, the actual kind of social capital is within these groups. And this was in turn paired with or resulted in a gap in understanding what the actual community-specific social support needs were among these groups of youth. Lastly, these, I hypothesize as part of this work that these social support needs are actually addressed in various ways through forms of digital communication. And an, a true understanding of that was affected by a gap in incorporating and understanding the use of these various forms of digital technology, including social media and games in the youth development programs that were set up to really help these youth. So this really informed the theoretical framework that I used by combining key theories to really formulate and the underpinning argument for this work. So we found across work in sociology and in kind of youth studies and youth development studies through Washington et al, through psychology with Bowen and Chapman, and through informatics and information science work through Dana Boyd's work, that essentially social support is a central concept that should be focused on for assessing youth needs and achieving community solutions. And this whole process of exchanging social support is often shaped by technology. So technology makes sense as a, as a particular context with which to study this topic. So this led us to our key research questions, which really focused on in what ways are at-risk youth using social media for social support? What, if any, specific social support needs arise for this population that are informed by their use of social media? And lastly, in a more secondary kind of next steps type of way, how can this information actually inform the current scope and approaches for designing and implementing programs and activities for these groups of youth. All right, so the couple, a little bit more background before we dive into the findings here, the primary method for the work was ethnography. I spent many hours, which was a lot of fun, just hanging out with youth at different boys and girls clubs and observing the way that they were engaging with each other, with the boys and girls staff and with the technologies that we're using through participant observation and semi-structured interviews. My informants were at two different Boys and Girls Club staff, and the sites that I selected were both in the Midwest and out here in the West in Santa Monica, California, and Lafayette, Indiana. I spent about 18 months in the field, conducted a lot of interviews and hours of observation, and then analyzed all of this interview and observational data. All right, so what did I actually find through about these research questions and through this problem space. The major outcome of this work was finding that the existing community networks that youth had access to, in this particular case, the Boys and Girls Club, as well as the varied social media platforms they use, really came together in a fluid way to form an ongoing and consistent platform for social support, system for social support exchange. And the system manifested in four major ways, combined constructed social support, negotiated allowances, social media emotional management, and unique mentorships. And I'll dive into each of these sections in the next few slides. Each of these sections really highlighted the key social support needs that these youth were trying to address through their social media use and through their engagement and participation in these youth clubs. And additionally, upon later reflection, 
each of these areas actually involved some shared behaviors with games as well. This is something that I wasn't necessarily looking to focus on during my dissertation work, but it came up organically and was sort of a precursor to the, thing, the connections that I later made as I transitioned into games research. So this first theme of combined constructed social support really demonstrated that both the Boys and Girls Club and the personal social media platforms that these youth were using filled different gaps in communication among friend groups and enabled uninterrupted bonding with close friends that continued on social media. So whereas lots of these relationships and these social support exchanges might start in the club, they importantly continued and were maintained through social media sites, as we see in some of the quotes uh, mentioned here on the right. The fluidity of the Boys and Girls Club and social media use and their use was a key part of serving the overarching social support needs of these groups of youth, where they were able to establish feelings of closeness and connection with their friends in a really consistent way in how they executed their use of a wide variety of social media platforms and their participation in the club. In retrospect, one of the early signals of how these needs and behaviors are shared across games and social media arose in this particular area, where I noticed that much of this close bonding, especially through the use of social media platforms, was really playful in nature, where social media was used as a tool to kind of fuel that sense of play and that use of play to bond with their friends and establish a sense of social support in their lives. So you see that Kim, a staff member at one of the Boys and Girls Club sites here, comments, starts to comment on the group nature of creating TikToks together as a more playful and consistent way of engaging and participating in the club. And more broadly, social media and phone games were both used almost interchangeably at times throughout my observation as sources of play in group social settings. So when youth were given the opportunity to more autonomously decide what they would like to do within the Boys and Girls Club space, they're interchangeably using things like social media and games to address their social support needs. And so ultimately what this means is that the goals remained the same, so the key needs that they were going after around connection, expression, and play, but the medium and the exact tools that they used to, to address these changed based on contacts and desire and other factors. So the second major theme that came from this work was negotiated allowances. And this essentially described the process where youth and their parents or other authority members across the club would use, would create kind of protocols and agree together on how they were supposed to use social media and how they were supposed to behave more generally in a social setting as a way of providing social support through protection and negotiation. And this particular point did get contentious sometimes between the youth and these authority figures, whether it's parents or staff, but these types of agreements were seen as building the right foundation for enabling safe and comfortable sense of expression, identity building and play on social media. And youth agreed to them because they perceived them to be social support driven. So they were set up as a, through a, a means of love and as a way of addressing their needs safely. Many of the same rules were also put in place for the ways that youth were allowed to play different games, but they varied uh, across different degrees depending on the child and the parental circumstances. All right, so the third major theme that came out of this kind of system of social support they observed was social media emotional management. And this described the process of youth engaging in social media-based social support seeking by to address specifically shifts in individual moods and the perceptions of friendships throughout days, weeks, or months. Social media came into play, uh, social media as play also came into account here where certain moods were actually paired with specific platforms, activities, or people in similar ways to what I eventually learned was applied in gameplay spaces as well, where it, later on in my games research, I started to see how games were often carefully and intentionally selected, depending on the mood and the goals of the player. So we see here, uh, especially in this lower right quote, that Renee, one of the Boys and Girls Club members, is talking through how she intentionally selects these different social media platforms to address these different needs, to help with her kind of emotional management, and to ultimately gain a sense of social support in her life. And the final theme here is around unique mentorships, where youth reported significant friendships with older or younger members across the club that were importantly sustained outside of the club through different social media platforms. These mentorships are important and this arose as a significant theme because they enabled space for exploration and for pushing the boundaries of what traditional friendship might look like. 
where social media became an even stronger tool for often exploring new forms of connection and expression, often with the opportunity to, to really express more mature sides of oneself as a form of social support exchange. All right, so what did all this mean? All these themes that kind of build up into a larger socio-technical system of social support. The system at the intersection of the Boys and Girls Club and social media really provides evidence for advocating for combining these two spaces for reaching ideal positive interactions and ideal social support exchange, most importantly. The elements of the system that I just described in these four major themes provide examples that can inform things like social media design and protocol at youth development spaces, as well as the way that we design specifically for social support. And these findings reveal that specific social support needs, social media motivations and uses, and key values for connecting social media and social support together. So this key takeaway really throughout the work are that there are overarching needs among these youth that social media is used as a tool to address and achieve. And this spectrum of social support needs centered on connection, expression, and play that are wholly addressed through the way that the Boys and Girls Club or other youth development spaces intersected with their use of social media platforms. So let's break this down a little bit more. Youth are using, as I mentioned before in the kind of tee off to this talk, is youth are using social media as part of a larger socio-technical system and that their core needs here that they're trying to achieve are self-expression, connection, and play. In the way that this manifested across the themes that I observed, the way that they combine social support networks and pursue mentorship, enable them to find connection on their own terms. The way that they align their use of social media platforms with different emotional needs and negotiate the types of allowances that need to be set for the use of these platforms, enable them to express themselves safely and comfortably. And lastly, they go through all of these processes and seek out all of the above in terms of their social support exchange to build opportunities ultimately for safe and flexible play online using social media as a specific tool. So understanding these overarching needs and the context that is, surrounds them allows us to focus on the core issues at play when designing for positive social media experiences for all users. And they enable us to make concrete, more concrete recommendations around designing these spaces in ways that actually really serve these needs, especially for these particular groups of youth and help achieve positive outcomes. All right, so at the end of this social media research is and this dissertation phase was where it started, just started to kind of scratch the surface of what the implications could be out of this work for more applied design recommendations. And so that's where I ended in social media research and that's where my journey with themes research actually began. It lined up a really exciting opportunity to translate some of this foundational research and these observations to something that was much more applied and design focused, but in a different context of games. So this motivated me actually to further explore what some of these connections and applications could be. The primary outcome of my particular games research while working on Stadia was building out a DEI rubric that was developed to evaluate and assess our games through an inclusion lens specifically. I was able to use the insights from my social media research to really inform the underlying understanding of the project, especially and specifically what the broader context was around the problem space, the key questions that we needed to ask, and building out a framework for understanding the ultimate impact and importance of the project. So one more piece of background here for folks who aren't quite familiar with Stadia, I'll take a quick step back and define the space. So Stadia is Google, Google's video game org, and it is a cloud-based or console-less video game platform. So really what this enables is rather than needing to build or kind of amass a set of you know, often expensive and multi-piece uh, technologies or equipment, you're able to just log into a browser and get into your game. And the mission of Stadia is to expand the creation, access, and enjoyment of groundbreaking entertainment. A lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about in this section was focused on the work that I did as part of Stadia Games and Entertainment, which is our original game content and publishing side of Stadia. Unfortunately, it was discontinued last year, but what I will be talking about today relates most to the work that I did as part of that team. So as part of this work at the starting point, we also had to put together and define what the problem space was, what some sort of framework was for understanding why inclusion in games was important and what we were trying to achieve and what the key questions were for this work. 
the themes from my social media research helped inform an understanding of this problem space framework and key questions for the project because they helped me understand truly at the highest level what the overarching issues were that we were trying to address. And these were barriers to play, self-expression, and connection as part of the broader core needs of the sets of players that we were working with and trying to design and build for. In the game space, these, this, these needs started to manifest maybe under slightly different headings or slightly different language, so things like representation in game, games and feelings of inclusion and belonging, but the overarching needs remain the same. These overarching and higher level needs may not have been as easily recognized or realized because of the tendency to kind of silo our analysis of games and focus more exclusively on just the core dimensions of gameplay, which might not necessarily entail or encompass some of that higher level need searching. The focus on gameplay dimensions is of course incredibly important, but for working on defining a space, especially as broad and complex as inclusion in games, I felt it was important to go a little bit broader than what we would usually work on and kind of seek out a more overarching sense of what is what matters in players' lives. This process of social media informing this particular project and this particular piece of work was a really crucial piece of how I was able to form an understandable narrative around the why behind this work, so why it was important and what we hope to accomplish in terms of the intended impact. And this provided really the scholarly foundation for a much more tactical and applied set of work. So how did we get to that definition of the problem space, the framework, and these questions? This really involved forming a broader narrative around what we were trying to accomplish with this process of defining and implementing and assessing DEI and why we were doing it. And what this meant is that we needed to craft a narrative around why DEI is important for video games more broadly, not just for our team. We did this through conducting literature reviews, informal stakeholder interviews, and internal resource reviews to really formulate and kind of build up this narrative around the work. And this is where our problem space framework and research questions really came to life where we could articulate what the overarching needs were that we were trying to address amongst our players. And these are the same ones that were shared with some of the previous areas of social media research. We landed through this narrative on three major reasons for why diversity, equity, inclusion, or DEI in games is important. And these reasons were informed by what we came to see as these overarching needs among players related to DEI, which were, again, connection, self-expression, and play. To identify these reasons, it really became especially important to resist looking at games as solely distinct and standalone form, separate from other forms of media and technology. And so the importance of this work relied heavily on understanding the larger socio-technical infrastructure that these games exist within. Similar to my research in the past on youth social media use, I had to think about what the overarching core needs were among these groups that were being served through the use of video games and what broader systems and associated issues these types of needs were tied to. And we looked to both traditional media and social media studies to help further uncover what these needs were and provide a really foundational understanding for our reasoning for going about this project. So let's dive into each of these key reasons for why diversity, equity, inclusion is important in games, how we communicated this to our team, and why it was overall significant. D diving into each of these reasons was an important piece of what helped our teams build empathy and understanding for our users. So this first reason around avoiding harm to our players really traced the history of the types of media issues that have persisted across various forms of media and technology and have only continued to manifest and continue to be present in new ways in current contemporary video games. And so through this use of and review of past research across um, different forms of media studies and scholarship, we were able to highlight what some of the current barriers to play were in terms of how players weren't able to actually address their key needs. So really highlighting that video games continue to manifest things like stereotypes um, and the, the persistence of stereotypes and how it leads to this ultimate difficulty in establishing a core sense of belonging in game spaces. To demonstrate some of these issues further, we also collected a wide variety of game examples and past research to help more strongly manifest how these issues um, look in the world to players and help build empathy across our team for these players' journeys and the barriers to addressing the needs. Each set of examples helped highlight a different aspect of overarching players' barriers to play 
and the needs that they were trying to address. So here, as you can see, we started with issues of representation across gender and race, where we saw in Haas research, this is from a study, uh, a CSCW study by Rankin and Hahn from a couple of years ago, where they found an inordinate disparity in the types of representation they were seeing for in particular black female characters in games. We then continued to expand on these issues in terms of how it influenced the ability or lack of ability to really gain a sense of connection, identity, and expression in game spaces. So here we see this really coming to the fore through the current experiences of queer and LGBTQ plus gamers, as well as Asian American gamers in terms of how they're intersecting with their sense of connection and identity and representation in games. We also discussed how this extended to issues of broader game identity and community. So not just within the gameplay itself, but how they were able to identify and connect to gaming, all of the gaming adjacent spaces around it, which ultimately prevented a full sense of community and play. Here we see this coming to the fore, especially in terms of uh, gender relationships with gaming, where though there's an, a relatively even split between men and women in terms of who plays video games, there's this tendency among women to not see themselves as gamers and to actually perceive the field of gaming to be more male dominant than it is. We contrasted all of these issues after doing this review and kind of talking through all of these, these issues within the problem space with the actual needs that we wanted to ultimately build and design for. And this was especially where learning from traditional media and social media studies around what players were trying to achieve and how we could help them address those needs came into play. So here we see since many decades ago, an understanding of games being an important space for self-expression and identity exploration ultimately used to create a positive space for all players. So the next major piece of this narrative in terms of building out the problem space and the framework for this work following avoiding harm was the way that we could use this to really support minoritized players and minoritized users. And the reason for backing this DI and games project helped hone in specifically on the overarching needs of minoritized players specifically and helped us establish an understanding that an expansion of what our current game process development process looked like was needed to actually meet the needs of all players. So what we were doing currently didn't necessarily address um, all of the needs that we wanted to actually address and kind of manifest and understand. So this was particularly articulated as minoritized viewers needing signals from us that we are actually addressing the barriers that we've seen after, uh, in decades of research and the ways that things like stereotypes continue to manifest in new games. And this can be brought about through lots of different things, including tactical moves like better balance and stories, bringing new perspectives into the games that we're working on, and insights that are really valued and heard among our groups of players. The last major piece of our narrative here was using the centering of diversity, equity, inclusion in games, really defining and evaluating it as part of our game development process as a way to bring forth imaginative and transformative game design. And so this involved thinking about how this type of process of identifying, naming, and evaluating diversity, equity, and inclusion could bring us above and beyond the way that we were currently working in terms of centering all players' needs championed through a diverse set of player perspectives by, again, doing things like addressing these key barriers and promoting diverse stories and perspectives. And specifically, this is where we started to make recommendations around meeting concrete guidelines that we could point to to evaluate our games so that we can be firm, consistent, and clear for both each other, our users, and our broader stakeholders, like third-party developers and other groups. So what the building of this entire narrative and kind of backing for the diversity, equity, and inclusion project teaches us, as well as the what how I was able to inform and integrate some of the learnings from social media research, is that games are also part of a larger socio-technical system that builds space for these core needs that are shared with social media spaces of self-expression, connection, and play. The first major reason in this narrative around the DEI games project for avoiding harm is a crucial goal for enabling, player, enabling players to really meet this core need of achieving a true sense of connection with both the game and with other players. The reason around supporting underrepresented and minoritized players provides the opportunity to actually create space for self-expression, 
and across both games and game adjacent platforms. So the types of communities that are surrounding games and the games themselves. And lastly, focusing on rehauling our current process of thinking about inclusion in games by focusing more on the transformative power of games and thinking more imaginatively mm -hmm. through inclusion supports new and widespread forms of play, not just for kind of the current set of players that we're working with, but for all players. So we see here that these three areas of DEI importance were the underpinning of our project and helped create shared empathy and understanding across this, this bit of work. And these areas were directly informed by the types of behaviors and the shared core needs that emerged from my social media research. This research served as the basis for how we identified the key needs and barriers we were trying to address in the game space by informing the foundation of that core bit of problem space, framework, and questions that came together as a broader narrative for why DM games is actually important to work on. Great, so now I've shared the underpinnings of this project and how social media research in the past informed it. So let's next dive a little bit deeper into how we constructed the actual rubrics so the output of all this narrative building, all this shared empathy and all this understanding building to actually center inclusion in our game development and design process. So we use this rich narrative that we built up that was informed by past social media research, including other intersecting areas like traditional media to define what diversity, equity, inclusion looked like for both our internal teams and our industry at large. And we landed on this being a pretty active and ongoing application of two central design and research process, processes in the development of our games. These two areas are product inclusion and inclusive design. And these were identified as key processes that enabled us to actively and actionably address the key needs that players are really trying to reach in their use of games, especially when looking at this in the inclusion realm. And this was also further informed by our broader understanding and defining of DI more broadly, understanding that DI is really kind of the representation of varied identities across the space, equity being the fair treatment and equality of opportunity and fairness, and inclusion being building up a culture of belonging by actively inviting contributions and participation across all people. We then further applied this understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion to our stadium mission as more of an internal way to demonstrate the importance of this work. After establishing this definition and this application of all the narrative building, we began to design the actual evaluation rubric, which was centered around the key goals of preventing identity-based barriers to play and identifying and encouraging opportunities for proactive inclusion. And this in turn became a two key areas or two key categories of the rubric, which centered on representation and interaction in games. We used product inclusion and inclusive design to really ensure across all of these, these areas that our games are psychologically accessible to players in addition to and complementing all of the great work that we already had in place on cognitive and physical accessibility features. This is all in service of really setting a high bar in terms of how we were assessing the quality of our games through a DEI lens. So to give a, a bit of a broader sense of the overall flow of this work and how it was built up, so how we got to these end kind of more applied categories from a lot of this more theoretical and foundational need setting, we started with the foundational understanding and defining the underlying needs that our players were trying to achieve, coming to the ahead with the identification of these key reasons for why DI was important and the narrative that was motivating this work. So avoiding player harm, supporting minoritized players and being imaginative and transformative. Then we moved into translating this to specific goals of the rubric that we were going to integrate, where we really wanted to use this evaluation process and assessment process to prevent any identity-based barriers to play and identify and encourage opportunities to proactively include all players. And lastly, this translated once more into specific rubric categories. So what we were actually looking at measuring and assessing in our ongoing game development process, which were the categories at a high level of representation and interaction and lots of subcategories within. The full application of this process really came about as a result of all of this initial narrative building. And so we were ultimately able to translate this to applied goals and concrete categories for evaluation. So while I unfortunately can't share a lot of the explicit details of the rubric, I'm really hoping to soon, kind of working on that, that process for making a little bit more open source, 
I'd still like to share a little bit more about the process and application, and I definitely invite you know, more questions afterwards if you have more specific ones, and I'll share what I can. Um, so we started just to give a kind of quick sense of how this unfolded with this problem scoping space. So this involved not only a lot of the narrative building, kind of applying this past research, but having conversations with lots of our cross-functional stakeholders to really understand what the problem space was and what our goals were across all of our roles. Then this moved into a lot of this kind of narrative building in terms of how we were setting our goals and structuring the specific resource. Um, this is especially where the influence of the social media research that I had conducted before came into play to formulate and articulate that problem space and narrative. And then after developing and designing the actual rubric and going through that process of, kind of applied research, we took this through various team reviews and presentations at a bunch of different team and organization levels where we gathered feedback and kind of raised awareness about the rubric's pur purpose to make sure that it was as feasible, understandable, and actionable as, as possible so that we could really build this into our existing game development. So the rubric was integrated uh, ultimately as a core part of the ongoing game evaluation framework that we already had in our user experience research. We use this specifically to flag and resolve DEI issues, both by uh, using these categories of the rubric to flag and resolve certain issues that came up during things like play tests or heuristic evaluations, as well as thinking about naming and identifying opportunities for proactive inclusion. So those are used to implement game features that really proactively addressed player needs, especially centering the needs of minoritized players. So a couple of examples here that I was even just talking about earlier included things like expanding the opportunities for character customization or rethinking the types of assumptions that were built into the narratives that were central to the game or that were connected to the types of object objectives we were asking players to complete. So as I mentioned a little bit on the past slide, in terms of how this is actually executed, we used a couple of different key methods. The first was heuristic evaluations, where this was particularly integral in this kind of piloting phase where we as a research team would heuristically evaluate the games that we were looking at and building and the specific content through a product inclusion lens and using inclusive design as a tool for that. We also integrated this into our standard play tests where the criteria and the rubric were translated into our ongoing framework um, through a set of agreement statements and measured through a couple different scales um, designated in its own designated product inclusion and DI section. And then we also had an additional layer of kind of gut checking and additional iteration through periodic publishing reviews. We would get members of our team together to evaluate the game and do a bit of a ongoing discussion and think alouds using again the product inclusion and inclusive design models. So I walked you through what I initially found in my social media research, how it connected to games research and helped us better understand what we were actually trying to accomplish by building out a process for inclusive design in our games. And lastly, just covered how we applied that sense of understanding and sense of app applied game development and DI evaluation to build more inclusive game experiences for our players. So why did all of this matter? Why did we do all of this work? Through the rubric development, development and through the shared understanding and empathy that we were able to build across our teams, we actually were able to build up and design a process for enabling us to ask the right questions or most appropriate questions around how we were addressing these overarching socio-technical needs of our players at each stage of our game development process. What you're seeing here is a quick snapshot of what that process integration looks like. So through our foundational, iterative, and evaluative stages of games user research, we now have to answer key questions related to product inclusion to really ensure that this is a core part, how we're able to ensure our game success and kind of tie inclusion um, inextricably with how we assess quality. We also established additional layers for broader impact through both educational and procedural levers. So the rubric was used to educate, like I said, to build empathy for our teams in a really ongoing way, which is exciting kind of the partnerships and conversations that branched out of this. And it set a high quality bar for the DEI lens that we were using to build our names and build up relevant scholarly and practice-based partnerships. Great, so what are the next steps for this work? How will this type of work continue? Like I said, the actual uh, in-house game development organization is discontinued currently, 
But the exciting piece is that this work continues to influence my current research at YouTube. As I sit in a place that's actually closer to my original area of research, so it's within YouTube, so it's within more of a social media role, but um, my product is positioned at the intersection of live streaming, fan funding, and gaming. So I still get to keep a foot in the gaming world and use a lot of what we've learned and what we've built to apply it in slightly new contexts as we evaluate creator-viewer relationships and how we design positive experiences for viewers and creators to engage. So I'm really excited uh, about some of the way that this work is informing ongoing work streams at YouTube using both my social media research and my past games research in more of a blended approach across these areas to actionably advocate for inclusion through an awareness and at these high level socio-technical needs that are being addressed. I'm also excited about finding new opportunities to apply this with new angles across um, how these spaces intersect. And I'm currently working on developing this thinking and more formal mediums, so things like uh, partner publications, uh, research, open source resources, and, and so on. All right, so what did all this mean? Let's kind of bring this all together as we wrap up the talk. Intersecting social media and games research is really enabling us to have and establish a more holistic view of these types of technologies as part of the shared socio-technical system by identifying these four needs of connection, self-expression, and play that persist across all of the mediums and technologies that are part of both social media and games. And this holistic approach can particularly be leveraged to enable inclusive design by centering the way that we evaluate, think about, and assess these spaces on what the overarching needs actually are. All in all, each of these pieces of this process of learning, research, and building across the context of social media and games have demonstrated this. And I also want to end by sharing that I think that I'm, I'm ex particularly excited to give this talk here because I think that there are uh, fantastic scholars and groups at Irvine that are already embracing the sense of fluidity across these spaces. Quick shout out to the work of Raising Big Gamers and Katie Mimi, um, and I'm really excited about all of that, and I think they really embody that sense of fluidity. And I hope to continue to develop my own thoughts in this area to really concretize this as a way of also bridging at a meta level academic and industry work for both scholarly work and design-based outcomes. And lastly, this is also an interesting way to kind of truly embody the sense of human-centered design in our work. Quick thanks to Kritika Jagannath who, for helping me actually realize that um, even more meta level of thinking because it's enabling us to place an emphasis on the fluidity of these types of technologies in the broader lives of our players and users, and in turn, enabling us to really champion inclusion in product development and design by placing ourselves in their shoes. All right, and with that, I will end and open it up for questions. Thank you so much. For I see some raised hands in the room, but also uh, I think Aaron raised a hand in the Zoom. Is there like a Yeah, process? let's start with let's start with one in the room and then we'll go to Aaron and then we'll go back to the room. I think you were the first one. Okay, yeah. Uh, so my I'll pick this up so I'll that. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. I, it was really great and informative and I, I really enjoyed uh, just, just enjoyed it. But I guess my question is uh, I was curious as you continue to talk about translating this, so how do you feel this deals with contexts that are outside of a US or European context? And how do the uh, values of DEI kind of work in spaces that don't rely on those kinds of logics and cultural assumptions? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Thank you for that. So one, uh, this is something that also came to the fore in our inclusion in games work. And part of the, I think that's especially where it's important to zone in on what the actual nitty gritty details of this assessment and valuation process are. So we are hypothesizing still that these overarching needs are gonna remain the same, but part of validating and iterating on that is ensuring that we're testing through our play test, through our heuristic evaluations, et cetera, with a, as diverse a group of both content and players as possible. And that was part of our process of iteration for the initial set of play tests that we used for the inclusive design and games work. So really actually, having both a set of like foundational interviews where we asked players you know, about their sense of inclusion, kind of what they were uh, picking up or not picking up in the ways that they were playing the game, 
but also more in a more tactical sense when they were observing their gameplay is that were there you know, different differences or distinctions that arose um, among different sociocultural groups, um, among different settings, and really using that to feed into our uh, overarching rubric and assessment. But I think your, your question points to an important tension here where we needed to center in on a couple of core overarching needs and a key kind of framework to work with to standardize the process. But I think there's an important acknowledgement here that we won't necessarily kind of capture everything. And so having a multi-pronged approach, so not just you know, relying on only the rubric, but maybe in turn developing other levers for assessment, other levers maybe for incorporating uh, assessments. So I think in this case, like things like participatory design would come into play um, really, I think really well and really appropriately are also important for acknowledging that there are you know, almost always going to be these assumptions that we're going into this with that aren't necessarily capturing our global group of users. So appreciate the question. Aaron, you want to go ahead? Yeah, can folks hear me? We can. OK, great. Um, it's great to, to have seen this uh, amazing talk. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, <clears throat> I guess uh, my question for you is, um, regarding the games uh, side of the talk, um, uh, it was really cool to see the rubrics that you all built out to build uh, DI into games. I guess I was curious if there, you may be an under NDA, so if you if you can't speak to this, that's okay. Um, but I was curious if there was any games that have gone through this rubric that you'd like to point to as being sort of like gold standards for um, uh, DEI in the community, in your opinion, things that have really succeeded. And if you can, um, tell us a little about why you would point to them as things that on the other side of the rubric have been really successful. Yeah, great question. Thank you so much for that, Erin. So um, in terms of specific game examples that went through this rubric, I don't think that I can speak to them because, not even because of NDA necessarily, but because of uh, the fact that they're almost all still in development. I don't think any of them have been released yet. So not necessarily supposed to kind of spread the, the games that are still in development. Um, however, I, I think I can speak a little more broadly to some of the examples from the game that I found without kind of like naming it specifically. Um, so one of the projects that we worked on involved a sort of, uh, not even necessarily an audit, but kind of one of these heuristic evaluations and publishing reviews of the uh, character design process and especially honing in on the way that different um, cultural groups or just different kind of community groups were uh, aesthetically represented and represented even in the way that kind of interacted throughout the game. And we were able through the process of applying this rubric to actually pinpoint certain areas that might be you know, misinterpreted or that might not give enough space for kind of the varied levels of representation within a specific community. And there were tweaks made in both the way that the characters were designed, but also the way that they were kind of named and framed within the game that I think hopefully will, will help make uh, the game even that much more kind of welcoming and help uh, establish that sense of belonging and inclusion that lots of our players are, are looking for, especially when they're just looking to have fun. So it's kind of one example, I apologize I'm not able to kind of name uh, specifically, but it brings me, it makes me think about like some of the next steps for this work that I would love to put together in terms of open sourcing, not only the, the rubric, but also um, thinking about how to pull together a, maybe even like a database or walk through of some of these examples as I think what you're talking about makes me think about how this could actually used as a really fruitful tool for, for game developers you know, across the industry. So. Yeah, that's great. It's hard but important work, so thank you. Of course, thanks so much. Oh, uh, yes, I think, oh, was there another hand over here? So. Maybe not. Sorry. I have a question, but I don't want to take the CEO. Oh, I think Mimi had a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see you, sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks so much for your work, Jennifer. And, um, I want to go into your dissertation, you know, back to the dissertation slide. Um, obviously, there's a lot of resonance with the work that we've been doing at the Connected Learning Lab. And one of the things that I've always appreciated about your work with young people on social media is you take sort of uh, a kind of commonsensically positive approach without getting wrapped up in all the sort of panic and fear about kids in social media, and I was especially struck by how the Boys and Girls Club, the 
the adult caregivers seem to have just dealt with it in a way that was positive. It's like, why doesn't that happen more often with kids on social media? And sort of my question to you is like, did that strike you? Like, it just seems so commonsensical and normal and sensible, right? But that's not how, at least in the public, you know, sphere, mm -hmm. this has been taken up. But I guess my question is like, did folks think they were doing something different or was it kind of normal and commonsensical? Is the hysteria and panic around social media actually a very parochial middle class preoccupation or elite <laughs> preoccupation? I just wanted, I was sort of curious your impression because you were actually there with real people <laughs> dealing with it in real life. Absolutely. Thank you so much for you. That's a fantastic question. Um, so, I will say actually on overall kind of uh, with a broad sweep, the, the take on, you know, how we're supposed to kind of govern and dictate social media lend, uh, was landed more positively, like you said, among especially the Boys and Girls Club staff. So a couple of hypotheses around, uh, hypotheses around that, because one of them touches on what you just talked about in terms of the background, like, is this, you know, particular to a set of generations or a set of time? The, the staff at both of these sites tended to be a little bit closer to the ages of the youth actually that they were working with. And so I think that there might've been just this organic sense of, of uh, more, not even necessarily more lenience, but just more like understanding and empathy for this is just like a new technology that they're using for, for play and for communication. So I think there was a little bit less of a barrier and distance there. Um, and in, in terms of that actually connected to that, I did see with among like kind of the minority of staff at both sites that did have a little bit more of that, that tendency towards like the moral panic kind of narrative around that um, were, were a little bit more of a, a different generation. So that's one piece of it. Um, the second piece though, in terms of did they notice what was happening or were they kind of aware of the fact that they were reacting a little bit differently? Um, I don't, it, we, we didn't really touch on it. I think they just kind of like it, it didn't arise to them as I'm doing, I'm thinking consciously about these use technology use in a different way than maybe uh, like media might portray or like other kind of panic inducing articles might portray. Um, it was more of a uh, coming from a sense of wanting to meet the youth where they are. And so I think that that naturally turned into, we don't necessarily want to turn this into something that we're judging or alienating because we see the ways in which it's being used and we know that we need to kind of align and meet them where they are too to actually make this work and to build the, the sense of trust that they wanted to build as well. So I think something that I didn't touch on as much here is that that line of thinking and the fact that the, the, these technologies weren't necessarily as, as demonized as they might have been actually helped with building that sense of trust between the counselors and youth. Where like, you know, we can, it's okay to talk about this, we can use our phones, like it kind of created and cultivated um, a more trust-based and kind of relaxed sense of engagement. And that's also why I, wanted in particular to work in this in-between space. I know that's something that you're of course incredibly familiar with too. So in between like the very rigid structure sometimes of home and, and school, uh, in that way to me, it really embraced that, you know, having that sense, that space for more kind of autonomy and exploration there. Yeah. Chris. Sarah, is there time for one more? No, good. Okay, so um, this will be the last question. I actually wanna ask, talk to you more about youth and in particular youth as an oppressed class, but mm. maybe we can do this um, later. They can't vote and the elderly own all the capital. <laughs> but um, I actually wanted to ask maybe a more personal question, if you don't mind, but this is a department that produces a lot of people who go work to industry. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, your own journey to industry research, particularly as someone who like me comes from a department that didn't produce a lot of industry researchers. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit to students who might be thinking about it. Absolutely. About kind of how you got there and how your academic training is very important. Definitely. Also a great question. Thanks, Roderick. So, and also I'm very excited to talk about the youth question too. I think it's such an important one. So ready to kind of geek out about that for a little bit. Um, so in terms of my own journey to industry, one of the reasons that I was really grateful and it was, I thought, really powerful for me to put together actually this talk in particular is because it traced my, the, the, journey that I took from uh, more of a, you know, strictly academic setting to one that's like more industry based, but still blending a lot of academic research. And in particular, I think it calls out 
some of what motivated me to make that that shift. So when uh, for for most of the time that I was going through my grad program, I did think that I was going to uh, pursue just an academic track and was still even up until last year applying for for postdocs and other positions. However, I took an internship the year before that point, and it intersected really well and, and just perfect serendipitous timing with when I was starting to think about at, at a higher level how I was positioning my own writing and scholarship within HCI. So I started to write a lot more about kind of the design implications for social media and how my work was going to feed into things like the way that we build social media products. And I realized that at that point, I did want more of a hands-on experience in terms of being able not just to make those recommendations, but make them with a, a very in-depth understanding of what those decisions look like and what's happening in those rooms. And so that's what I that's what I went into my initial industry internship thinking, um, and ended up going really well. And that I found it very invigorating to be kind of presenting the pre presenting my research, and then sometimes like even weeks later, seeing the changes that I was recommending, you know, in in the products that I was building, which was really cool. And then I, I felt that that in turn, in some ways, enhanced my own scholarship and that the ways that I was writing then about design implications became that much richer in terms of how it was informed by my uh, personal experiences there working on those product teams. And so I think it manifests really well in this work because it shows the way that I was able to kind of use a lot of the what I learned already about social media spaces and really uh, funnel that into that much more kind of like applied and integrated uh, space. I still personally, I mean, I, I don't think I would ever go like so far into the applied space that I wouldn't, or that I would close the door and kind of the, the academic scholarly piece. I, I love the, the blend of the two. So I still like to kind of keep them both and both how I even do my day-to-day -day work um, as well as like how I position myself as a, as a professional, but it's kind of a, a quick walkthrough of that decision and what I, I felt like it, what I felt like I gained from that. Thank you. That's really helpful, thanks. Oh, of course. All right, let's thank Jennifer and we can prove those things. For those of us who are in person, we can move to the reception at the time.